Welcome back, everybody. So we are going to prove that if you have a continuous function, then it is going to be Darbo integrable. And our proof is going to use this integrability criterion that we proved in the last video. All right, so how about we get to it? So we'll start by writing down this theorem. Continuity implies integrability. So f is going to be a function from the closed interval a, b to r, and it's going to be continuous. Well, we'll just we'll make this a complete sentence, and we can say if f is continuous, then f is integrable, or remember we're going to say Darbo integrable if somebody is checking what type of integration we're doing. All right, so let's see how we are going to do this. So first, because we're working on a compact interval, okay, that's, that's pretty useful here, and we have a continuous function, well, then we know that the image is also going to be compact. In particular, it'll be bounded, and uh, heck, we even know that it's uniformly continuous. How about that? So since... This interval is compact, and f is continuous. The f image, which is f of a, b, is bounded, and f is uniformly continuous. Okay, so that was one of our cool theorems, is we got uniform continuity if we knew we had a continuous function whose domain was compact. All right. Now our goal is to show that f is integrable. We want to use the integrability criterion. Integrability criterion, you recall, tells us we need to show that there exists some k such that for all epsilon, there exists partitions such that the difference of the upper and lower sums are going to be less than k times epsilon. But the key thing here is, right, we need to fix some epsilon greater than zero. So let epsilon be greater than zero. Now, once I have epsilon, I know I can uh, use the uniform continuity of f. So since f is uniformly continuous. There exists some delta that depends on epsilon, but not on any of the points in the domain, such that uh, if, well, let's, let's put x and y into this interval, a, b, and let's make them less than this delta of epsilon apart, then the difference between f of x and f of y has to be less than epsilon. Okay, so we can find such a, uh, a delta. Okay, now uh, I want to choose a partition, all right, because for the integrability criterion, I'm going to need partitions. Um, in fact, I'm just going to choose a, a single partition. Uh, that's going to be enough here. Uh, but what I want to do is to make the partition fine enough that every single one of the subintervals in the partition has length less than this delta of epsilon. All right? Now, how, could, how do I know I can do that? Well, the answer is, of course, if I take any partition, right, there's some partition, I can measure the lengths of these intervals, and if it's too uh, too big, right, if none of them is, or some of them are still uh, greater than delta of epsilon in length, I can just keep on subdividing them, right? I can just put something in half, right, put it in the middle, and I can keep on adding more and more points, and at each step I can get them smaller and smaller. Now I have to be careful in how I do that, but I can always put it smack dab in the middle and cut the size of the, the interval in half. All right. And eventually, right, if I look at 1 over 2 to the n, eventually that will get less than delta of epsilon. So I'm going to choose 
a partition, we'll call it X, so this is a partition of AB. Okay, so X, say it will be an N partition. So X is equal to X0, X1 through Xn. And recall I sub K, we could define that to be the interval Xk minus one to Xk. Okay. And I wanna choose it such that the length of I sub K is less than delta of epsilon for k equals 1 to n. Okay, so for all of these different intervals, they're all going to have length less than delta of epsilon. All right, now I can restrict f to being a function on each of these intervals i, k, which are also compact intervals, which means I can apply the extreme value theorem to f on each of these in intervals individually. So by the extreme value theorem, the supremum of, say, f on ik, right? So the supremum of f of ik equals the max f of ik. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second. The extreme value theorem tells you that a maximum is going to exist for any continuous function on a compact domain. Okay, but the maximum, if it exists, is equal to the supremum. Okay, that's very important, right? The supremum we know is gonna be the least upper bound, but if you actually have a maximum for your set, that is always the supremum. All right, so we, we get this equality, right? So IE, right, there exists some point, let's call it Z sub K, and, and since it's going to be a supremum, right, or a maximum, I'll put a little bar over here because we're also going to have an infimum or a minimum. So there is some zk in I sub k such that f of zk is equal to the maximum or the, I mean, either way, it's maximum or the supremum. So the supremum of f of ik, which is the max of f of ik. All right, and this is for, again, for k equals 1 to n. And similarly, I'm going to get a minimum and hence points, right, where f of, say, some, this is a z upper bar, I'll have like a z lower bar k, that's going to give me the minimum. So, uh, and, so the infimum of f of ik is equal to the minimum of f of i k, i.e. there exists, and now I'll use a lower bar under this z k, such that f of z k lower bar is equal to the infimum of f of i k, which is equal to the minimum of f of i k. Okay, so Here's a question, how far apart can the Z bar upper bar, right, and the Z lower bar be? Well, if we redraw the picture, we know somewhere in here is the partition we're actually looking at if I choose some K, right? Of course, this is, by the way, also for K equals one to N, all right? So let me, I blow this up, right? This could be my I K. So I K is here, so this is X K minus one, this is X K. And I know that my Z K bar and my Z lower K bar are somewhere in here, okay? And I don't know exactly where, I don't know what the ordering is, but I do know they're somewhere in this interval. So maybe this is Z K upper bar, and this is Z K lower bar. And you might think, well, wait, shouldn't the lower bar come first? Because it's smaller, right? No, not necessarily, in fact, it's not that f of, or not that z bar is, you know, upper bar is the bigger one. It's that f of z bar is the max, and f of z bar is the lower one. We have no idea if this function is increasing or decreasing between these points, right? We don't know which of them actually came first. We just know what happens to their f image. All right. So what can we do with this? Well, because they live inside this interval, then we know, right? This implies that the difference between them 
has to be smaller than the length of the interval, right? Or well, possibly equal to, right? So less than or equal to the length of the interval, because it could be on the ends. But the length of the interval, that's assumed to be less than delta. All right, so we know that the distance between these two uh, <laughs> z's, that's supposed to be a k, uh, is less than delta of epsilon. All right, well, that's kind of nice because we know if things are within delta of each other, then their outputs are within epsilon. That's going to be really handy in just a moment. So since we're trying to get back to that integrability criterion, which is going to have something to do with uh, subtracting upper and lower sums, and upper and lower sums have to do with suprema and infima, dot, 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 let's make a note. So we have that the supremum of f on ik minus the infimum of f on ik. Well, this is precisely equal to f of zk upper bar minus f of zk lower bar. And as we said, because zk upper bar and zk lower bar are within delta of each other, then this distance has to be within epsilon. Now, Normally when we write down this, right, we need to put absolute values. And well, we don't seem to have absolute values here. Uh, and that's simply because we know that f of z upper bar is the max and f of z lower bar is the min. Okay, so this is really the z, f of z upper bar is the bigger one. So we don't need to have absolute values there. All right, so let's use this now to say something about the difference of the upper and lower sums. So this implies that the upper sum on x minus the lower sum on x is equal to, well, let's see, each one of these is a sum. So let's put a sum here. And x was an n partition, so k will go from 1 to n. Now, each one of these is going to look like the supremum times the length of ik or the infimum times the length of ik. So I can factor the length of ik out. And there's actually two of these sums, so I can put them together. And so this is going to be the difference in the supremum of f of ik from the infimum, or with the infimum, of f of ik times the length of ik. OK, but we just established in the previous line that the difference of the supremum and the infimum is less than epsilon. So this piece is less than epsilon. And so this entire sum is going to be less than, well, this is now this epsilon is a constant. Let me pull it out of the sum. And I would just have the sum k goes from 1 to n, the length of ik. Well, now I'm just adding up the lengths of all of the intervals in the partition. Where'd that partition come from? Ah, yeah, right, it came from up here. Right? You had a to b, and the length there is b minus a. So if I added up all of the lengths of the, all the partitions, I would just get b minus a. So this is epsilon times b minus a. Let me put the b minus a in the front. Because now what have I done? I've shown that the difference of my upper and lower sums is less than some constant positive multiple of epsilon. So by the integrability criterion, so by the integrability criterion, f is Darbo integrable, All right? Our k is b minus a in this case. All right, and that's the proof. Oh, it's not too bad. All right, so we have established that if you have a continuous function, then you are Darbo integrable. What I'd like to do in the next video is to start building up a little more general situation. What if, uh, what if we don't have a continuous function? What if we have a continuity or discontinuity or maybe even more than one discontinuity? Like, I don't know, how about four discontinuities? Is it possible that our function is still going to be integrable? All right, so we'll see you when we do that next time.